Okay, here it goes. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of Real Estate Investing 365 with me, your host, Justin Hanna. And today, I got an awesome guest from Indianapolis, Indiana. His name's Zach Harris. What's up, Zach? Thanks for being here. Hey, Justin. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, no problem. Hey, so yeah, we met um, through a couple people that we kind of mutually know, and and Zach's a, a realtor. Um, do you focus mostly on commercial properties, Zach? Uh, personally, for buying, yes, but I help people get their foot into the market more on the residential side of things. So single family houses and small multifamilies. So you know anything under four, uh, but predominantly single family, duplexes, things like that. Okay. Cool. So why don't we get started and you can kind of tell your story because I know um, we'll get into it, but you, you are a younger guy and you seem to already be killing it in the investment market. So kind of give us your story, um, yeah. where you are in life, um, how you got started in real estate. Yeah, sure. So uh, right now I am in my fourth and a half year of college uh, because I've transferred a few times. Um, but currently, I'm, I'm in Indianapolis going to a school called Marion University, studying business management there. And um, I've grown up in Indianapolis, so it's always been my home. But uh, I was down in, down in Florida going to school for a little while, and that's when I really got into real estate and realized that I was uh, on the wrong end of, of it. I didn't want to be the broker. I wanted to be the owner, right? And really what had happened was... Uh, I was, I had started in like lease to own down there as an internship and they had me cold calling. And so I, I would give some of that to why I'm, I would say as personable or confident on the phone is just because they would give me a stack of leads and say, Hey, dial. Right. And, um, so I, I, I learned kind of how to articulate myself a little bit better. And then I got my, my real estate license down there and started doing, college like leasing to other students and i figured oh you know i'll just do this until i sell my million dollar houses on the beach and that didn't work out too well so uh i realized you know, man some of these some of these people that i'm leasing their houses to uh they are making all the money and it was one one house in particular i think it was like a six bedroom and i, I took this it was like a section of a fraternity to this house and I'm like yeah we'll take it and they were charging six hundred dollars Per, per room, right? So we had six, six rooms at 600 bucks. And I'm thinking, man, this guy's making a good chunk of change just for owning the house. And so at that point, I figured, you know what? I need to go back to Indianapolis where I could pick up houses for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and rent them out for five or 600 bucks, uh, not continue to, to get little commissions on them. So that's kind of how I ended up back in Indianapolis. And uh, so that's kind of where we're at today. <clears throat> okay, cool. Right on. So down there in Florida, um, you were working for like a wholesaler or? No, so I was working for uh, like a lease to own or rent to own company. And I, I came across them. There was like an internship day or something at the school down there. And, and I, I knew that I wanted to get my real estate license. And I said, oh, this, you know, this looks interesting. So I walked up to one of their reps and, you know, kind of back and forth and ended up going to an interview and I got it. And I was, I was excited, but I thought it was going to be, hey, you know, 10, 15 bucks an hour, or you go in there a couple of days a week. Well, it turned out that they must have seen something in me where I was that bright eyed, bushy tailed college kid and I did okay on the phones. And so then it turned into, hey, you know, we'll pay you an hourly rate, hourly rate but you know, can you get on and, and sell some things and we'll give you a commission on the down payment? So that's when it really started to uh, turn up a little bit for me. And, and I felt like, man, I was making a ton of money. And, you know, this was a couple grand for a young kid. And uh, it, that to me is, I think, what really sparked my my interest in real estate later, pushing me more towards the leasing and, and realizing, man, the consistent income is is what's drawing me and not just a big commission. Che I, I say big commission check. Maybe back then I felt like it was big. But yeah, uh, yeah that's kind of how the ball got rolling. Um, my My grandparents and parents had some involvement in a couple single family rentals when I was growing up, but it was never something where I, I thought, Oh, I'm going to go do this full time. Right. I was always waking up early on the weekends with them and you know, they're, they're driving me down there to go paint, you know, and turn a, a rental property. And I just, I hated that. I'm like, Oh, this sucks. Like, you know, crappy properties. And yeah. so that was not my, not my first path uh, that I thought I was going to, going to be following. Well, yeah, you weren't seeing the, the rental checks they were getting every month. And no, no, it was, yeah, early mornings and 
not my favorite. <laughs> right. No, I hear you. So, okay, cool. So you go from uh, Florida, you decide to transfer back up to Indianapolis, you come up there and yep. you got your real estate license in Florida, but I'm sure you had to get uh, your real estate license again once you got to Indianapolis. Yeah. So I, I thought I didn't even, I didn't even think to look at, you know, Hey, does Indiana have mutual recognition? Well, obviously at the time they didn't it so happen that Florida would record would recognize an Indiana license, but it, you know, vice versa, it wasn't the other way around. So I had to go through another 90 hour course um, to get my license here. And, and it, during that time is when I, I got my first rental. And I remember just like, I mean, it was, it seems like, not that long ago, which I guess it wasn't, but uh, so I was valing, I, we moved, or I moved back. I was living with my parents. Uh, I was valeting cars and I knew, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to get into real estate and I worked out a deal with them. If I found a property and, you know, kind of did the work, they would front the money. And at the time, you know, I'm thinking, man, I, this is going to be a big deal. It's a 20 or $30,000 house. And, um, so that's what we did. We ended up finding a house and we can dive into this later when we get into the deal specifics, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I did. So I, I had essentially, I don't know, maybe five or six grand in my name. Uh, luckily they were in a position to, to where they were willing to partner with me, but I think that they knew I was serious about doing it. Hence why I moved back, um, you know, kind of pursue the real estate uh, side of things. Yeah. Cool. So, um, what you might've mentioned it, but what were you going to school for? So I was going to school initially, uh, I want to go to med school and I got to, so I've, I've been to three different schools, um, and so I'm a little behind, but my, my first uh, option was, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to med school. I'm going to go, you know, be a doctor, be an anesthesiologist, uh, plastic surgeon, something along those lines, and, and put my time in with school. Well, once I got into real estate, I quickly realized, man, uh, that's not where I want to be, so... Yeah. You know, I have a couple of friends that were going to go to med school and along the way they found other careers that were like, man, am I really going to go to school for the next 10, 12 years and do my residency and everything? And I get out and yeah, you might be making a few hundred grand a year and eventually sure there's a huge upside, but man, it seems like if you find something else you're passionate about, a lot of them just end up saying, eh, let me go do something well, different. And kudos to those people because they are way smarter than me and, and probably way smarter than I'll ever be. But uh, I just, I got to the point where I'm like, this, is, this isn't going to work. I mean, you, know, you see some of these people who you talk to from day one, they're like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to law school route. I'm going to be here, here, here. And this is, year, this is what year five, six, seven looks like. Same goes for you know, the med school route. And for me, it's just been like, all right, well, we're going to go over here and try this. And um, yeah. you know, luckily, it's, it's, it's worked out so far. Yeah, that's cool. So why did you decide to get your real estate license if – as opposed to just focusing on rentals where you just like, uh, well, I need a f source of income and I need yeah. to learn real estate yeah. and let me try to start selling. A hundred percent. I'm, you know, I was uh, literally the day that we closed on that rental. Um, I don't think, so we closed on the rental while I was still in class and then I ended up taking, uh, the state test. And the day that I passed, I, I just, I stopped showing up to the valet company. I mean, there you, I was getting paid like four bucks an hour and then you had to split tips and, Oh, it was brutal. It was right. absolutely brutal. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I just, I saw it as a source of income, right? So uh, I really, I saw what, what kind of money my managing broker and some of the people that I knew down in Florida were making just off of helping people out and, and being kind of that guy in your network, right? Or that guy or gal in your network. Like, oh, hey, I, you know, I, I need something with real estate. Oh, I need to go to Zach. I need to go to whoever. And for me, that's, that's what became, I think, the, the center for how do I go and educate myself to the degree where, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm 19, I'm 20, I'm 21 years old. You know, you could say the same thing to a 17-year-old kid who's getting ready to turn 18 and wants to get his real estate license. Go educate yourself to the point where you know the most about a specific topic, right? And go out into the market, provide value for people and transact. And so that, for me, was what... I think drew people to me to want to want to transact. So yeah, hey, you know, put the the rental aside, whether I have that or not. I was still able to go out and help people out, right? Hey, you're looking for a rental. I started to learn how to underwrite. I think that that's the biggest thing today that I see a lot of people, whether it's on podcasts or just any social media. They're like, oh, I want to get into real estate. I want to be a multifamily. I mean, you know, I'm a wholesaler. Well, what do you know about it, right? Have you watched a couple Instagram videos or 
Are you read how many books you read in a week, right? What are you doing when you're driving in the car? Are you listen to podcasts or are you listen to freaking music, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I hear this quite a bit, but for a while, like I wasn't going out, I wasn't partying. I mean, you can ask some of my, my friends, like, oh, dude, Zach's, you know, he's falling off the face of the earth. And like, there are some people who I stopped hanging out with because I was focused on that. And, and that sounds pretty cliche, but I was like, look, man, here's where I want to be. And for whatever reason, in 2017, I started writing down my goals. So I think I started with like, sell one house, right? Sell, you know, this, have X amount of streams of income, have so many rentals. Um, and that's, that progression, what I've seen is like, when you write it down, it comes a little, little bit more real, right? And so like, even, even my board back here today, it, it's a constant reminder of like, hey, what are you working towards, right? So every day when I come down the stairs, I'm like, okay, dude, that's your number, right? Or that's, that's who you're going to help today. Yeah. So that for me is what kind of pushed me along. But I think getting the real estate license was, was really pivotal in, in helping me try to obtain income to then go and place it into something else or at least gain the knowledge. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you, you touched on s- several great points there that um, a lot of people, especially younger people and myself, when I was younger, I kind of did some of those things, but some of those I wish I would have done better. Um, and we could go off on a whole nother podcast about those. <laughs> but two of the things you said that I really like there is one, um, learning as much as you can about what you want to get into. And yep. so I'm the same way. Whenever anybody gets in the truck with me or the car with me and we go anywhere, I'm just like, okay, sorry, but we're not listening to music. We're listening to either this audiobook or we're listening to this podcast. Yep. And uh, it's actually kind of transitioned to my wife. And so she's in the fitness industry. And all she does now is just listen to like fitness podcasts and building her fitness brand and her business and stuff like that. So yeah. That's huge for new people getting in is just like consume yourself and start learning the terminology, right? You can't touch on that enough. I mean, like learn the terminology, go get into a room with somebody that that's killing it. That's doing way better than you because automatically I think you're just going to be lifted up by those people. And that's what I, I mean, I remember sitting in rooms where I felt like I have no idea what's going on. I am the smallest guy here in terms of knowledge, money, you know, everybody talks about their door count, da, 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 right? But you learn and, and you grow. And I think if you, you can take that knowledge and apply it, um, you're going to go a lot farther than what you think. And I yeah. wish I would have thought bigger looking back. Yeah, no, me too. And, and one thing I did the, the first time I ever heard that was listening or I guess, I, yeah, I listened to the audio book of Rich Dad Poor Dad, just like so many people yeah. had. And uh, he said, just learn the terminology. So what I did is in my work truck, I set the station to CNBC radio, money radio or whatever it is on whatever. This is before I got into real estate investing. And all I did all day is listen to the stock, um, whatever money radio it was. Because I didn't know anything about finances. And all, all I knew is that I needed to listen and hear, you know, what rates of return was and net income and all these different, um, you know, price to earning ratios and all this stuff. And so that's a great tip for anybody listening. Just turn it to podcasts and just start learning it. So yep. that's great. And then the other thing you mentioned there was like some of your friends thought, Oh, maybe Zach had fallen off the face of the earth or whatever. Cause you're not partying, you're not going out. And, uh, you know, that's one thing people really miss the point of is that you don't like stop becoming friends with those people. But if you really want to move up, I feel strongly that you have to like, everybody always says it, but get your group of friends. Like you should be the, the lowest or, or everybody oh, around you should be where you want to go. And that's great that, that you did that. And, you know, people will kind of look at it like uh, you might be being a, a jerk or something, but you got to keep your well, eye on the prize, you know? I would agree with that a hundredfold. And don't get me wrong. I did my plenty of pa- fair share of partying and all that jazz. And it's, it's a blast. I love to go out and have a good time. But at that same token, I don't want to be the guy that's doing that every single weekend. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, hey, it's the same people. It's the same crowd. Like, I, I want to go out and travel. I want to go see different things. I don't want to just be with the same group of people hanging out in the same town for the rest of my, I don't know. I just. No, that's awesome. So. And that's, for, so everybody knows, how, how old are you now, Zach? I'm 22. So 22. I will be I could, 23 here in December. Okay. See, so, I mean, you're, you're on top of it. I mean, a lot of people don't get out of that phase till they're. 35 years old. You know what I mean? So <laughs> look, everybody, awesome. everybody goes to different stages and I think it goes back to what you've been exposed to. Right. So <clears throat> when people will say, Oh, well, I want to be rich. Right. Or I want to be 
this or I want to be that. Well, who are you hanging out with? What are you, what are you consuming? What's your perception of that? Right? Like my definition of wealthy might be different than, than the next guy in line. And, it, and I think that really is because who you're aligning yourself with, who yourself, with, right? Who's in your network that you could go to and say, okay, Hey, this guy is, or this guy or gal is really modeling something that I'd like to be in the future, right? or they have traits that I'd like to mimic, right? Not that you need to go out and compare yourself to everybody else, but I think that there's a lot of things that you can pick up from others and, and substitute them in your life, right? Whether that's different goals or, or things that they're using in their business. I mean, that's, it's just competition. <clears throat> right. No, that's awesome. So good job on all that. So let's go, let's, let's kind of sidetrack here, get off sure. the sidetrack and your, your first deal, you kind of touched on it, but let's dig into that sure. a little bit. Dig into it. Okay. So this is a single family, um, in Indianapolis in a little bit of a rougher area. What, what most people thought. So when you come to Indianapolis, you'll find this out. I hope, I hope I'm not giving anything up to your audience here. If you come oh, to no. Indianapolis. No, yeah. I'm going um, to Indianapolis so everybody knows. I'm heading out and me and Zach are meeting up soon. Indy is as a moving market right now. And so anyways, <clears throat> it's block by block here, right? So you get into a, a place where there's a lot of gentrification going and then two blocks down, it's a war zone, right? Um, this particular area is really close to where I went to high school and where I go to college now. So my high school and college are, I mean, you could walk there. It's, it's that close. Um, and it was a little pocket neighborhood just, just by the schools. And as a local, I knew that that area wasn't too bad. It was, a, it was a good little place where not a bunch of crime, a good mix of owner occupants as well as, as rentals, right? And I think that that was a big, big mover in why I bought there. Um, so I went in, um, probably looked at, I don't know, 20 or 30 houses. The realtor that I was working with at the time probably wanted to kill me uh, because he knew that I was going through the classes and all that jazz. And at the same time, I think he was trying to shop me to come on to his brokerage, you know, once I actually passed and all that. So anyways, we ended up finding a house. I used my Florida license to get a referral fee on the deal. It was like 25%. And again, on a tw- it was so the, the deal itself was twenty eight thousand um, dollars. It we I lucked out because it was move in ready. And what had happened was there's a, a company here that employs a lot of people called Eli Lilly, and it was an Eli Lilly executive that had a small portfolio of singles. And over the years, he'd had tenants, you know, turnover. And this particular place had just had a tenant turnover, and so he dumped a bunch of money into it. And we were at a weird time in the market where. Stuff was just sitting and it was still pretty cheap. I think this was 2016. Yeah, I think it was 2016 or 2017, maybe summer of 2017. Went in, bought it. it w- we did not put a dime into this place. I mean, I know a lot of people say, oh, I didn't put any money in. Yeah, okay, we did some things to clean up. Not a dime. Bought huh. it for 28. Uh, didn't know how to screen tenants. I think I, I borrowed or I found a lease from maybe my grandpa back when he had rentals. So I kind of changed some stuff up with that, went to Lowe's and picked up a for rent sign, got a Sharpie marker and wrote, (laughs) wrote my number on the sign and put in the yard. So then a couple hours later, I'm getting all these calls and you know, I didn't know how to keep track of it. I mean, I didn't have Excel sheets. I I was, it was a one man show. I didn't know what was going on. So anyways, ended up setting a day like on a Saturday, kind of had like a little open house where people came through and we ended up, uh, signing a lease with somebody well they wanted to do month to month because they were moving in from another town um didn't do a background check didn't i mean there was so many mistakes made i I could go on and on on a whole other podcast but we signed that lease for three months uh at 800 a month so you go and buy a 20 you know twenty eight thousand dollar house and you're like man sign at least for eight hundred dollars a month that just doesn't seem right and so i'm like all right you know kind of one foot after another here they didn't, they stayed, uh, another mistake. I'm collecting rent by hand. You know, it was just dry. I remember driving over there, you know, on the first, like trying to text the person, Hey, you know, you have the rent money. Okay, great. They're paying in cash. Another thing not shouldn't accept cash. So did that. They ended up signing a year lease at six fifty. Uh, I knew I was over market on the first sign. And, um, so I, what I was doing is was splitting the money between myself and my parents. So like, Hey, you go do the work. You know, we brought the money kind of like a JV deal, right? And uh, so it worked out well. And 
they started to talk to some of their friends, some of our other family members like, Hey, we just picked up this house for you know, 28,000 bucks and, and we're making this kind of return on it. And so then I started people, I started to have people come to me and say, Hey Zach, you know, if you find something else like this, you, know, you let us know and, and we'll partner with you. And I'm thinking, well, okay, might be onto something here. Right. And so at the time I was, I was continuing to do some more brokerage and whatnot, but that was the first deal that, that I really got into and it kind of sparked my interest in not only the single family space, but the private capital space and so on. All right. So yeah. All right, there's a lot to unpack there. No, yeah, that's great. That's cool. So um, that first deal you used an agent, you said, um, yep. do you know this agent already before you started working with them? No. So I, I forget how I came in contact with him. I think it might've been on one of his listings <clears throat> and then he ended up showing me some other houses and then we transact, we transact on that, that first rental property. Okay. So you think you just like saw a house for sale, you called the agent and it was him and you said, Oh, by the way, I'm looking for some other stuff. And he ends up showing you more and more houses. Yes. <clears throat> okay, cool. So you find this house, was it listed at 28,000? Uh, so it was listed, I think for like 30, I think it was maybe 34, 35 and some change. Okay. Um, but just came in kind of low. Thirty-four. And, and this was in 2017. Yes, this was in 2017. Yep. Which is like, I feel like that was yesterday. It, it's <laughs> crazy to me to look back and think, okay, prices were that low at that particular time. And you, I hear this all the time where people, oh, the market is just too high right now. So you just, you got to get in. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So you find the house, 34 grand, you put an offer in, you end up closing the deal at 28. Yep. Um, did you guys pay cash for the house and your parents yes. fronted the money? Pay, paid cash. They fronted the money. And like I said, it was a 50, 50 JV after that. Okay. So was, they, they were comfortable 50, 15 with you cause you were doing the work. You were going to be yep. the property manager. Yep. You kinda, did your parents go with you to kind of find, to look at the deals or was this just all on you? This was all on me. Now, granted, we, you know, we, we did do some things, right. The third party inspection, um, had reviewed that with them. Cause again, this is the first first property I'd done. Um, it's not like they were avid house buyers, right? It's like, Oh, well, we don't know what to look for here, here and there. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was a learning process, I think for everyone, but I was leading the charge there on that first one. And, uh, I'm just glad that it didn't blow up in my face. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, definitely. And so, yeah. <clears throat> so you did have your, your parents helping you, but that doesn't really matter in the, in the grand scheme of things, because even if you didn't have your parents, you still had some money saved up. You were, you had a job with the valet and you were going to start doing real estate. So yep. I'm sure for a $28,000 house, it would have been perfectly fine for you to get a, a first time home buyer loan or something like that, because the down payment would have been like 1500 bucks or something, you know, so, so regardless of, and, and I, I've seen this across a lot of platforms. I've heard this many times, um, you know, getting into it. I think they trusted me a lot because I was educating myself. They saw that, you know, I was ordering, ordering a couple, you know, three, four books every other week. Um, not going out. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm just studying, reading, you know, and I think that they saw that and saw that I was passionate. And so I think with the education that I, that I was starting to obtain, regardless of whether it would have been them, another family member, a close family friend, I think that I still would have sought that person out and said, hey, look, here's the opportunity. And, you know, as a 19, 20 year old kid, I'm thinking, man, 20 or $30,000 is a lot of money. When in the grand scheme, it's really not right. You have some people who say, hey, yeah, just, just go do it. Right. And you see syndicators that are raising all this money. So looking back, I think it was, it was good for me to have um, that amount of money to start to work with because it, it did give me a lot of respect. But what I'll say in, to that is, is play your cards, right? So there's always going to be somebody that's richer or, or wealthier or that has a better network or is that they're from a different area that's more affluent. So, you know, because, oh, you know, you, got, you come from family or you come from this, you come from that. You, you got to play your hand. And if, if you're not dealt a good hand, Go, go make yourself another one. I mean, I hate to, you know, I hate to say that, right. But you got to play your cards, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. Um, that's awesome. So, okay. So you close on the deal. You said there was some, uh, definitely a bunch of mistakes that you made. I mean, you mentioned yep. that you were taking cash. You just didn't know how to manage it, but was there one big mistake that you made on the property that you kind of like that you really learned from that next time you weren't going to make that same mistake? So 
there's, uh, I would say there's probably two things. So within that lease that I used, I don't think we had anything about in there about pets. Uh, same thing for the appliances, or I shouldn't say the appliances, the washer and dryer. Um, I didn't know that, you know, when you, when you buy a property, you gotta, you gotta let, you know, you gotta let the tenants know, Hey, look, you can either have pets or you can't. Right. And if you do, Hey, there's a pet deposit. Yeah. 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 Um, and there were some item or there were some issues that kind of trickled down with like a number of puppies at the property and dogs and neighbors calling and this, that, and the other same thing with the appliances, but okay. Hey, this is broken. And now that's broken. And this was the washer and dryer. It wasn't like the stove or the refrigerator. I know a lot of landlords will, you know, Hey, if they buy a property and the washer and dryer sets there, they'll just say, Hey, you know what? These, these are yours. We're not responsible for them. Uh, and that was something that I didn't, I didn't do. So it was like, Hey, you know, this is broken or that's broken. So uh, there was some replacement of, of washer and dryer, but you know, aside from that, it wasn't like, Hey, I, I bought something with a foundation issue. Now I have done that on another property, but um, that first one, luckily it, it was in it was in good enough shape and it was small enough that it was controlled risk, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, cool. So yeah, the property as far as structurally or the property itself goes, you, it was really a great starter property. Yes. The only problems really came from the, I guess, due diligence side of your, of, of yourself, just yeah. knowing what you're getting into, which isn't really a bad thing, right? Because it's, it, you could have analysis paralysis and sit there forever and say, well, I don't know how the lease is supposed to be. I don't know how to get tenants. I, da, 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 da. You learn by doing, man. You yeah. learn by doing, and there's going to be costly mistakes, but I was glad that I learned on a $20,000 property as opposed to a $200,000 property or $2 million property. I think the biggest thing that I see too is so many people are so gung ho to go, Oh, you know, I got to get into a multifamily property. I got to be, you know, this millionaire real estate investor. Like, dude, it's okay to go buy a single family house and learn, learn the vendors, especially if you're out of state investing, go learn the market, right? Go deploy the capital on a smaller property and learn because if it goes horrible, okay, great. It was $20,000. Not that that's a small amount of money, but I would rather lose on that as opposed to 2 million. Right. And what's you know? the worst, what's the worst that can really happen on $20,000 house? I mean, you're going to be able to rent it out to somebody and guarantee it's going to cover your mortgage. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Okay. So, uh, this, this house, do you still have this house today? No. So I guess kind of continuing on from that, it was an interesting deal. So bought for 28, held it for, it was about 11 months. We had some, we, into uh, 2018, the market started to, to kind of heat up. And that's when I had bought another property on that same street, uh, actually two other properties on that same street after word had kind of started to get out that I was doing all right on these properties. Well, I bought one cheap enough to flip it. And I listed it on the market and ended up selling it for 45,000. That was a, a couple doors down. So this, this one we bought for 28, I just decided to put all of them that we had in that neighborhood uh, on the market at the time <clears throat> for like double what we paid for them. And so I listed that one for 48,500 and we got a full price offer within like three or four days. And I'm like, this, this doesn't seem right. Like surely, surely something's off. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, it worked out. And that this particular buyer ended up buying a couple of the properties I had and uh, we 1031 those spawns into an apartment complex. Okay. So what was the, what was the rent on those properties at that time? So gosh, we, I picked up one for 22,000. That was the one I sold for 45. I put eight into it. Uh, the third one was bought for 31,000. That was rented out for 700 a month. And then the other one that I had, I bought for 23,000 um, that I bought it from the owner occupant. And then the plan was to have three months of no rent. And then the fourth month, uh, they would start paying 650. These were all two bedroom, one bath. So anywhere from 650 to 700 bucks, uh, in terms of rent. Okay. And did you split all three of those deals? Were you 50, 50 partners with those or? Yeah. So I did, um, I did 50, 50 on, on the other two. And then the flip that I did, uh, I just got a, like a loan. It was a, it was a loan. And then I had to split 
the profits uh, with the investor. Okay. So you had three exactly. rentals and the flip. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, the flip will. So I, I had some money saved up on that one uh-huh. and I had about, so through brokerage, I saved a couple more thousand dollars to build my net worth, I think to about $8,000 and I completely emptied all my cash, uh, into that property. So they bought the house. I bought, I paid for the renovations. And I think by the end of the renovations, I had like, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks in my account. So I was kind of stressing a little bit, but, uh, since getting my license, I was able to, to list the property on the market. And then I think it was on the market for like two weeks. Started going back and forth and, uh, it wasn't a cash purchase that, that the buyer made. It was a conventional loan. And that's what inspired me to, to sell all the rest, sell off the rest of the properties because they had taken on a mortgage and changed the comps in that area because they were all within about a quarter mile of each other. Okay. So that's good. So that's because yeah. you had the market knowledge because you were an a, uh, agent in the area and you were yep. selling all the houses. You knew like, Oh, well this one sold at this price. So now I'm a, I bet I can sell these ones at this price. Yep. And it's just like, I mean, it's just like anything, right? Whether it's, whether it's single family, if, if you own a bunch of single families in a, in a certain area or you have a big multifamily building, you can kind of control the rent, right? Same thing. If you're controlling those properties, you can kind of dictate what they're going to sell for. Yeah. Um, which is nice if there's not a lot of houses in that particular neighborhood, which was the case. All right. Cool. That's awesome, man. Okay. Yeah. So let's fast forward to where are you now? How many units do you have? What kind of properties are you buying? Sure. Um, that's that sort of thing. So uh, now I'm I'm focused more on apartments. Uh, I will. I really haven't bought as many single families just because I don't have a management structure in place, um, like in house, if you will. And for me, I think this the scale uh, makes more sense on multifamily. I've started to look into some mobile home parks, as has everybody else. Yeah. Um, storage units. It's interesting to me just because you can get more units under one blanket. Right. And, um, so buying predominant, predominantly apartment complexes, um, in June, we closed three properties. I'm doing a, a duplex kind of house hack and burr, I guess, if you will. Um, I'm not a big fan of the burr and all honesty, I know that's going to spark some stuff with, with the bigger pockets followers, but, um, for Indianapolis, it's just hard. I think the property values are so low. It's hard to get in unless you buy just so far under market. Uh, that you can, you can make some profit, but yeah, mostly apartments. Um, like I said, in June, we closed three properties. It was a duplex house hack kind of bird deal, uh, that all live in, uh, it was an eight unit apartment complex and then a 19 unit apartment complex. And, um, all of that stuff aside from the duplex are JVs. Um, so I just do a 50, 50 partnership with folks and, uh, and kind of work it that way to where they bring the capital and I, uh, I bring some of the mark, I bring the deal. I bring some of my knowledge to the table in terms of multifamily operation and, um, and that jazz by no means am I an expert or anything like that, but I think the trust that I've built with some folks, uh, they like working with that and it's not just, Hey, I'm going to be an agent and sell you this next deal. Right. Okay. So the, you said the burr, just to clarify for people, you said the burr is kind of hard to do out there because yeah. what you're referring to is because you, you would have to purchase the property for such a low price yep. in order to have the construction costs built into the refinance to make money afterwards. It, it, it sounds great on paper. And, and I think that in other markets, it certainly worked. Not that it doesn't work here. Um, I have seen some people that, that do well with it, but that is such a hot topic right now. Um, I get everybody and their brother that, you know, will, will message me on bigger pockets or LinkedIn and say, Hey, you know, you got the bird deals. And yeah. I think what people don't understand is there's the labor right now is tough to find to, to get this work done. Definitely. And so you get these contractors that get in there and they give you a quote and you're like, what, this isn't going to work. Right. Um, and so that for me is, is a big turnoff. Uh, like with this duplex, for an example, that one was just, the person basically gave it away and I'm, I'm renting right now, which as dumb as it seems. Right. And I'm like, man, I, this is like, I live in downtown Indianapolis. I live in a nice apartment, but it's still money that goes out every month. And I'm like, this is just dumb. Yeah. Right? Well, like, the, yeah. Like I, I don't like that feeling. Um, I know that, you know, Cardone's like, Hey, rent, you know, 
rent where you live and, and buy what you can rent, which I like that, that theory. Um, but I think with this particular deal, the refi will be big enough to um, put me into another deal uh, or, or just give me some liquidity to go out and say, hey, look, um, I can go do X, Y, Z. I don't want to be that real estate agent who uh, you're only as good as your, your last deal, right? So that's kind of my thought around it. And it, it'll give me, I think, just a, a place to call you know, headquarters until I find that next opportunity. Well, yeah. And, and it's going to be great because you're going to have no, it'll be fine to live in the house that you own if you don't have any money into it exactly. and you're able to live for free because you're renting the other side out. Um, yeah. Where I think it does make sense for people to just rent is like in my, in my case with the family of five of us, you know, we're going to sell our house that we're now and we're going to rent for the next couple of years. But that's because I'm not going to go spend 500 grand on another house because I, I need to get my, you know, money working for itself instead of yep. sitting in this house. So, yep. okay. So that, that all makes sense. So now it seems like you're at what? 20, um, eight plus 19, you're at 27 units. So, so actually we have, I have, uh, I have 40 units. Oh. So we have a 19, a 10 and eight, and then I have a duplex. And then I still have a single family that I bought, uh, with a partner that was, um, about a year ago. And this deal we bought for four, 14,000 was all said and done. It was like 16 grand and the tenants pay five fifty a month and they've been there for 12 years or something like that. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, they just kind of hang out and we don't, we don't really bother them. They just, they just pay and, and do their thing. Um, but those deals are out there, right? Yeah. Could we go out and sell that thing or could we've gone and wholesaled it? Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Why? Why? It's making so much money. You're going to yeah, make money I mean, back. And I love to do more wholesaling and whatnot, but I just, I don't know. I like, I like to hold on to it. I like the cash flow. Yeah, so. no, I agree. I'm in the same boat. Okay. So we're, we're going to dive in. I wanted to pick one of those deals that, to dive into a little bit more. Okay. Um, yeah. Real quick though. Do you have property manager for all these or do you manage them all? So it's a, it's a mix. Um, on the apartment complexes, we have third party management, which, um, I will say for some of your listeners who, and even you two who are looking at some of these, like a smaller apartment communities or complexes, you don't get the kind of management company that these people who are doing large syndications get right. Like it, you go get a 200 unit complex, even a 50 unit complex, uh, your management company is going to be probably different than what you go get on a 10 unit, uh, even an eight unit. And what I found is these management companies, uh, I, I have, I have issues with how they're kind of running things. It's not as efficient. Um, sometimes I think on these smaller properties and I say smaller to some people, I think that, you know, a 10 or a 20 unit is this big thing and it's really not. Uh, but when you look at it from a management perspective, it's not a single family house, right? So it can't be treated like that. And I think with some of these management, these smaller management companies, that's what you run into because larger management companies, uh, at least here in, in our market, from what I've seen, aren't as willing to touch an eight unit, a 10 unit. Right. And so now you're kind of in this weird place where it's like, well, who are we going with? Right. And so we're going through some, some management trouble right now and getting ready to fire one of our companies because of that exact reason. Um, it's just, that's one of the issues that you run into. So when I say, Hey, think bigger, like for, even for me, it's like, Hey dude, you just got to go bigger because you get what you pay for. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, definitely. So, that, that, <clears throat> that definitely makes sense. Um, so let's but, go ahead. So like these smaller, like the single family, we don't, we don't do anything. This duplex, I'll set them up on, I don't know if you're familiar with cozy or not. Mm -hmm. so i'll set them up on cozy um but yeah the smaller stuff i just i kind of do my own thing but back to my point earlier i don't buy single families because i just don't want to hand them off to a management company here when i'm in the market right and so is anybody that doesn't know cozy is like a um a property management software that yeah. for individual investors like, like <laughs> us right now right yep it's pretty good pretty okay. good stuff cool so um and we'll link to that in the show notes definitely 
Uh, so let's dive into how about the 19 unit? Cause I know we, we touched on single yeah. families, duplex, and then everybody and their brothers into the multifamily thing, yeah. including yeah. myself. But what are you yeah. going to do? I mean, that's hey, kind of the, it's the hot, it's the hot topic right now. It's kind of natural progression. So let's dive into right. the 19 unit. Where sure. is the 19 unit that you guys own? So, so this 19 unit is, uh, it's, it's actually in a tertiary market outside of Indianapolis. And, um, we, like I said, we bought that thing in June. I, uh, I have this weird thing that I do. If I have free weekends, I will, uh, I'll just pick a market and I'll go drive it. And, uh, I may spend five hours in that market, just driving around. I'll go get lunch. I'll talk to the locals. Right. And just figure out, Hey, what, what's, what's happening in this town, right? Is, is there anything good that might be, uh, of interest? And so I happened to be driving and I, I actually found this, I think it was the eight unit from a for rent sign. And I called it, I called it a, actually, I, I, I would write, I take this little notebook with me. I don't know where it's at. And uh, I write down all these addresses of this market and then I'll come home and I'll, I'll research them and figure out who the owner is and get their number and all that jazz. And then I'll cold call. But, uh, I found this from, like I said, calling a for rent sign and, uh, found out they had more properties. And this is the case in a lot of these smaller towns where you have landlords who will have you know, what we say is a big portfolio for them, you know, may, hey, maybe it's 20, 30, 40, 80 prop, I don't know, right? And so they're like, yeah, actually, we're, you know, we're in our 60s, we're getting ready to, uh, you know, to get out of this, we want to do something different. And it worked out great, because I was able to convince them, hey, um, I'm a young guy kind of getting into the game, and, and I want to, I want to buy your properties. And I just, I was very straightforward with them from the get go. I was like, I do not have a million bucks sitting in a checking account. I said, this is how I do things. Um, I want to come meet you in person. And I think the transparency really went a long way with them, especially when it came to working with the lenders and things like that. But I can, I can dive into lenders. I can dive into the numbers, whatever you want. Just let me know. And I can, I can break it down. Yeah. So you found it by calling on a for rent sign on an eight unit property. Yeah. And they yeah. said, did you buy that eight unit property? Yep. Okay. So you bought the eight unit and they said, Oh, by the way, we also have a 19 unit for sale. And you said, well, well I that's... knew that they had a 19 okay. like, when I researched them because they, they had it all. And they weren't, they were mom and pop, but they had you know managed to get an LLC together. I still was able to get past that. And, you know, I, we can dive into that too, but you know, basically figuring out, Hey, who are these people? And then figuring out, okay, how many properties do they have? But I really wanted both that eight, that eight unit and a 19 because they had other properties, but I just kind of cherry picked the best ones. All right, cool. So we, we covered how you found it. You found it by driving for dollars, really driving yep. around, you find it, you see, yep. it find, yep. and then you identified the address. You went back and just so anybody that doesn't know, um, you probably, um, looked up the address on the, the, um, assessor's office and you found the property and then the, yep who who it's the taxes go to right and it said it went to an llc yeah so and you then, can either do that or if you have an you know most people won't do this but if you're an agent um we have there's a thing called realist that that people have access to or you go to the the county assessor right and you figure out okay who is this where's the tax bill being sent and then if it goes to an llc or has a po box go to your state website and figure out who own or who's the the um, registered agent for that LLC. And then it'll usually have a name in there. And I just go to fast people search. I, I call up all their numbers and I just cold call them. Cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what I do. It's free. Yeah, that's exactly what I do in, um, in, in Idaho. I just go to secretary of state once I find the LLC and then I yep. use white pages. I just paid for a, a 20 bucks. I think it was like 20 bucks for a year or something for whitepages.com and uh, gets all the information. So right on. Yep. Cool. Okay. So that's how you found the deal. Um, yep. how did you end up financing the deal? So we went through a, just a, a lender. Um, there was somebody within my network. I had shopped some, uh, like local community banks and they were, they were pretty competitive on rates and whatnot, but it was a lender here in Indianapolis who we went through. Um, I think we ended up putting 25% down we were at a five, three rate, five, three. Yeah. I think it was five, three, um, five year, five year balloon. And then we had a 30, no, I'm sorry. 25 year in. Okay. So, uh, Not bad. 
yeah, a five year um, term yep. with the bloom payment at the end, or did you have the op- do you have the option to refinance after that? We do have, yeah, we do have the option. Okay. And then a 25 year AM, which for people mm-hmm. don't know, that means that the payments are going to be broken down over a tw- like it was a 25 year loan. Yep. Um, so that's good. Makes the loan payments a little bit less. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you brought in a partner with this, you said? Yes. So I brought in, um, we basically did two LLCs that own the property LLCs to so their subsidiaries. And uh, from each LLC, we brought in equity. Uh, to take the place down for the down payment, capex items, and um, I'm trying to think. Then we went through the uh, the third party lender. Yeah, that, that was that was it. Cool. We get lost in the LLCs. I don't know how you are with your properties, but we keep our properties in, in all separate LLCs. Yeah, and you know, so far I have I don't do that because okay. for one, I'm here in California. Oh and my gosh, I totally forgot. Yeah, yeah. It's right how now much it's, for an LLC out there. Yeah, you got to pay 800 bucks a month or 800 bucks a year for a LLC fee, which is not that much, I understand. But since I'm planning on moving, it's just, I've just, that's brutal. I keep it in a trust. I hold my properties that I've okay. had um, in, the tr- in a personal trust. And it seems good so far, but I probably should switch it up. Well, I mean, the LLC, to get an LLC going here, I think it's like $96, $98 for the, oh. the year. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, my wife and I do have, I've mentioned it before, but we own a gym and uh, we opened the gym in January, I think January 3rd of 2019. Okay. But we officially got our name and everything like in December 15th of 2018. Okay. But we had to pay the $800 LLC, oh. the franchise fee or whatever, the LLC fee for 18 and we hadn't even opened yet. So we we're already automatically 800 bucks in the hole and then January comes and we have to pay it again. So it's just, Man, it's California. They're going to it's beautiful to live out there, but they get you somehow. They get you somehow. <laughs> now the new, the new rent control statewide and what is it? 5% stuff. a year. I, I don't even know. I don't even look because I'm, uh, I'm out of here. I'm ready to go. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So anyways, um, back to the deal. <laughs> we could go on about that forever. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> this, uh, how much did you need to buy in the property for? Um, well, I hope, I hope you sit, I hope you're in your seat, but, um, you know, it's always interesting when people will talk to me who aren't from the Midwest and what we're buying stuff for here, but we picked that up for 450,000. Um, and then we had our appraisal that came in, uh, at at half a million. So, you know, on the day of closing, not only did we leave with, you know, prorated rents and, um, security deposits, but we also had $50,000 of of instant equity like that. So it was a good feeling. Um, because that's the biggest property that I've taken down uh, with with some partners to date. And, you know, it's just one of those things, whether you're doing it on single family, whether it's a fix and flip or a big multifamily property, um, it just kind of gives you a, a little bit of a confidence boost, right? And kind of solidifying, hey, you know, maybe I'm doing something right here. Right. No, that's awesome. So you got it for about like 20, what was that like 22,000 a, a unit, a door? 23 a door? Let's see here. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, because my, my partner is was like, hey, what are we going to sell this thing for? 40 a door. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 23 six a door. Okay, so 23,000 bucks a door. And how much does each unit rent for? Um, right now, we are probably average rents. We have a mix of one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Uh, I think the ones are average rents about 580, and the twos are just over six. Um, pretty low in terms of uh, where they're at on on current rents, but since purchasing, we we've only had one one vacant unit that we just uh, just turned around. Um, carpets being installed this week, so uh, we're looking to push those rents up to market. So we think we're going to get we're, we're going to start advertising our uh, our two bedroom units at seven sixty, and then we'll do our one bedroom units probably five ninety five. Um, we're still kind of testing the waters there. No, that's, that's awesome. So a lot of people, they look at like the 1% rule, the 2% rule. And usually people are looking at that for like single family houses, but I kind of look at that number two for multifamily. <clears throat> yep. And so there you're looking at like two to almost pushing 3% rule. Mm-hmm. If you look at it per unit um, yep. cost and then rent. So that's great. So it's, 
it's just different, you know, in some of these tertiary markets, you, you have to be careful, you know, with, with trying to charge too much, right. Because you're going to have a, a completely vacant building. So yeah. we don't want to do that, but a lot of our residents um, in this particular building are older. And so, um, you know, we're trying to be respectful of that and, and not just coming in and tearing everybody out of the units. So you have some people who are in, you know, yeah, their life cycle there. And, you know, it's, as much as I don't want it to be, you know, like that, you, you kind of have to you walk that line. No, definitely. And I definitely feel like you can't always be like the money hungry, like the landlord, just like up and rents, up and rents, up and rents, especially if you right. have like good, you, you still got to keep your, your morals about you, you know? And, and yeah, I, I see that happen all the time, especially with people who are like, I'm the landlord, they're the tenant. Like it just, that's, it can't, it can't be like that, right? No, you, like, you can't. You're providing a service for them in return. They're, they're compensating you. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you're, it's a mutual relationship. You're transacting. Yeah. They're and, definitely, uh, they're your customer. You know what I mean? The, I, see that, I see that far too often. It's like, well, we're not fixing this cause they're not paying on time. Huh? Yeah. Like, <laughs> what? Right. I mean, I get that, but I, I think that when you're looking at it from a business, there is some, some aspects to it to where, Hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a person like, I wouldn't want to be treated like that if I was living there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do, I will, I will say is when, and I've heard about this and I've read about it, but when you buy a property that has been kind of neglected um, by the, the past owners who, you know, aren't really taking care of things is probably best as what they should be. And you go in there and you start to turn some things around, even if it's as simple as pulling out some bushes and trimming trees, residents are like, Oh my gosh, like, this it's been years since this has been done. Right. Uh, yeah. We're so thankful. And that's kind of what's cool uh, to see last night. Um, my partner was down and inspecting some of the units and there was a, a resident that came over and was like just astounded by how we had turned around the unit. Like this is just so, so pretty. We, we, we can't believe this is happening here and just appreciative of, of what was going on. So that that's pretty cool. Um, aside from, Hey, this thing's spitting out some good cash. Uh, it, it is, it is pretty cool. No, yeah, definitely. It sounds like you guys are doing a good job with it. So, um, now since it was a, a 19 unit property, yep. um, you got a commercial loan on it Yep. and, um, w was there any t types of, uh, what am I trying to say here? Was there any types of inspections or anything that's different than a single family property that, um, like maybe surveys or anything like that, that you weren't expecting? Um, no, we just, we tried to do everything by the book. Um, just in terms of like, you know, sometimes people will do a survey on single families. I've bought enough now to where I, you know, I won't, but when you're getting into, you know, commercial debt like that, I mean, it's, it's a scary thing, right? It's like, oh, okay, this is kind of, so, you know, are we doing the environmental by the phase one? And for, for your listeners who, you know, don't know what phase one is, you can kind of probably dive into that, but just making sure that, Hey, there's not anything that we could run into post close. We're like, oh, okay, what's going on here. Right. So doing the physical inspection, walking the roofs and getting an understanding of, okay, what's our CapEx budget look like before we just get excited about closing on an apartment complex. Like it's great to say that you own one and you run one, da, 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 but I think it's, it's better when you say, Hey, we have, we have money lined up to be deployed when, you know, six ACs go out and you're not scram, you know? So for me, there's, there was a little bit more that went into it from that standpoint, but no, I mean, it's just, it's just like buying a single family house, except you're doing it 19 times. So you're, you're making sure your eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed. Right. Cool. Okay. Um, and then you touched on management. Um, is there any big mistakes you made on this property that, um, you'll learn from for the next multifamily? Um, well, let's see here. I think the, um, the timing and, and closing, I'm pretty impatient. Like when I get a property under contract, I'm like, boom, I want to close this, right? Like I want to go. Yeah. And I think that probably that was, was a big mistake in terms of, um, hey, you need to shop all of your lenders and make sure you have a good understanding of, look, here's our contract. You know, we have 60 days to close. We got to make sure we're within that 60 days, right? Um, luckily, like I had mentioned earlier, the transparency and rapport that I built with the seller was it was allowing us to extend 
for some of the things that um, the, the lender was needing more time on. Um, secondly, I would probably say uh, in terms of property management, just really making sure that, that there's an alignment of, of interest in, you know, I know a big thing that we're struggling with right now or the management company struggling with is like the marketing side of things, right? Like if we go, you know, if we're, if we're a prospective tenant, we have some college, we have a couple of colleges in this particular market that we're in. I, a lot of my, I'm a college student. A lot of my peers are college students. So where's the first place I'm going to go if I need to find a place for rent? Probably Zillow, right? Yeah. Um, making sure that our, our product, our unit is being best displayed on that, on that platform, right? Like I, it can't be listed under a single family house. It can't be listed. Like, like I, you only have so much time when you're scrolling. So I want it to look good. The pictures look great. Right. Um, that's one, one thing I would probably stress on the next purchase is, Hey, you know, make sure that you're asking the management companies the tough questions because it's not always going to be rosy. And that's, that's something that I'm fearful uh, and seeing people even today buy properties like, oh yeah, you know, I got 50, you know, 15 million doors and you know, it's all, it's all great. No, it's not right. Like all kinds of people run into problems with property managers, with contractors. So just being upfront with yourself and saying, Hey, look, ask these questions that maybe you don't know the answer to, or you know the answer to, but you're kind of testing them. Right. So that for me is probably the, the biggest thing moving forward. I think we bought it, bought it right. But poor management can quickly run a, a good deal into the ground. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely. And if, if you are like an out of state investor, um, keeping a, keeping an eye on how your management company, I mean, if they're, they're always full and everything for one thing you have to look at, if it's always a hundred percent occupied, well, that's kind of a negative because maybe you're not charging quite enough in rent, mm -hmm. but if you're getting down to like 80% or 75% occupancy, well, right. you should be looking and seeing, asking your manager, like you're saying, like, the, where are you marketing? Like, why aren't you marketing on this? Why aren't you marketing on that? And if they're not willing to tell you why or a good reason, um, it's time to start looking elsewhere, I think, you know, so. If you're talking to your management company and they're saying, we, do, we just, you know, we just don't know why these things aren't running. They're in great shape. Probably time to go to the next one. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, cool. So from here, where are you, where are you headed? Where do you want, where do you want to go? Where do you see Zach in the next uh, five years? Um, so right now I am, uh, I'm kind of building out a team on the brokerage side of things. So, uh, I enjoy brokerage. I have a lot of fun with it. The hustle, the, the grind is, is fun. Um, but I also enjoy to kind of helping some younger guys out, um, getting into the, into the space brokerage and, and even on into multifamily. Um, so kind of building that out and really just assessing, okay, Hey, wh where do I want to be in the next three years? Where do I want to be in the next five years? And I think previously it was like, Hey, you need to have X amount of doors by this age and X amount of, you know, and I think that's good and well, but what I'm, I'm afraid of running into is just buying deals to be buying. Right. And I don't want to be that person that's like, ah, well, you know, we're closing on this unit because I gotta, you know, I gotta keep up this ego thing. And for me right now is like, just continue to look for home runs and, and keep your, keep your head to the ground, um, do right by others. So really I think, um, in the next couple of years, I think that I'll see myself in a, in a role more of a, um, an operator and not so much as a, as a broker, but, uh, you know, things can change. So, you know, I don't want to say, Hey, I, I got, I got all this planned out, but I have some, some direction as to where I want to go and where I want to be. I definitely want to split some time, you know, here in Indy and in, in the, in the summers and then somewhere a little warmer in the winters, but, uh, I need to have the systems and team underneath me before I start getting too squirrely and trying to get out of, out of the state or, or something like that. There's a lot of money to be made in the Midwest, but, um, I just, I want to continue to take advantage of that and, uh, and let that service my lifestyle. So on one hand, on the business side of it, um, you're going to try to build your real estate team and grow that and kind of yeah. be into a team lead situation yep. where you have agents working on you. And yep. then on the investment side, you're going to stick kind of with multifamily and just yep. start yep. to grow. Um, but don't just look for the most doors. You're kind of looking to make sure that you're hitting your numbers, you're yep. hitting your cash on cash and um, that yep. sort of thing. And if syndication, you know, um, presents itself, I think that there is definitely some room to go do that. Uh, I just want to make sure that prior to going and, and getting into full blown syndication, I have enough deal history behind me to say, Hey, I've had X amount of deals run full cycle. 
I have, you know, a nest egg of my own properties that they're spitting out a ton of cash. I don't need to go do this you know, and work for fees to keep the lights on or anything like that. There's a ton of people that uh, make lots of money doing syndication that are way smarter than I am. But uh, I think one thing I got to keep in mind too, is it's not a game of trying to keep up with the amount of doors you have. It's like, Hey, look, let's take a look at a balance sheet, right? Like, you know, where, where's your, where's your network going and, and what are you doing to try to build wealth for not only yourself, but your family. So for me, that's a big thing um, in positioning myself to say, Hey, look, uh, you know, by the time I'm 30, Hey, I can, I can just kind of hang out. Right. I don't think that's going to be the case, but um, I, I just want to be in the position to do, do whatever it is I want as cliche as that sounds. But I think re I truly believe that real estate uh, will get me there. Not so much just selling 40 or $50,000 houses for the rest of my life, but you know, it goes back to having that, that, that book of deal history and saying, Hey, look, I've been there. I've done that. Now I can go do a 40 or $50 million deal. Well, I do think by the time you're, you're 30, which isn't that far off, it'll be here before you know it. Um, seems it's that I, I just turned 32, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, I'm sure by, <laughs> I'm sure by the time you're 30, you'll be financially able to do whatever you want, but type of person like you are, you're not going to just go sit on a beach and like Brandon Turner always says, what, what does he say? Watch dancing with the stars or whatever. So yeah. I think it's not a, like I said, I think it's to some degree it's, it's, uh, you're having fun with what you're doing. Right. I mean, yeah. At the end of the day, if you're not happy with what you're doing, you, you should probably go find something else. Cool. Right on. Um, All right. So what is, uh, what is your favorite resource to learn about real estate? Is it podcasts, love, books or what? Love, love bigger pockets. Um, but I'm a big book person. So every morning, um, I try to get up around five, sometimes it's six. Uh, but I, I always, I'm always at the gym and I always have a highlighter, always a highlighter in a book and I'll just walk on the treadmill and people probably think I'm a weirdo, but every morning it's so, I mean, a big book that really got me motivated and fired up about multifamily was, uh, I think it was Dave Lind, Dave Lindahl, uh, multifamily millions was a good one. I think he's got, oh, you have it? I have it right here. Yep. Dave um, multifamily millions. Yep. Right here. There, yeah, that was a good one. For there was some passage in there. I think I remember I was I was at the gym and he mentioned something like, you know, there was a guy that he was it was a workout buddy of his who um, who, who was getting ready to lose his job and I don't know if he was working in, in some corporate job or banking job, but you know he was making okay money and and Dave was just kind of thinking to himself, man, I'm you know I'm a pretty young guy. I was making like three or four hundred thousand dollars and you know I kind of control what I'm what I'm doing. And so to me that was like, man, that, I love that. Right. And I'm at the gym. So it was just, it was a weird thing that I, I don't know, I guess I'll remember for a while, but yeah, I remember that same part. There's a, there's just a, a bunch of good authors out there. I, I can't say enough about, and even real estate books that are books that are outside of real estate have helped me kind of shape uh, my perspective on, on what it is that we're doing. Um, you know, rich dad, poor dad is, is obviously a good one, but there's all kinds out there. Ray Dalio, I'm a big fan of him. Never split the difference. I mean, these are just some good ones that, I don't know, like yeah. a big reader. Yeah, no, podcast. So pod, you like listening to podcasts and podcasts can kind of give you a good like overview and kind of like a yep. inspiration to like, okay, like get your ass in gear a little bit, but yeah. books seem to really like get the nitty gritty and you can kind of learn like specifics more in books. Yeah. I mean, there's that, that yeah, I can't speak enough about enough good things about bigger pockets. Uh, but I would say too, like if you're going to read those books and listen to those podcasts, don't be afraid to go to the events. Right. Like I know somebody like, Oh, you're not going to, I remember, I think it was one of the very first event that I went to, I don't know if it was a family member or something. You're not really going to that, are you? And then after going to that event is where I actually met some of my partners and it's a lot of the business that I do now. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I think that there's some that, they go to those events and never actually do anything. But I think that you can get a lot out of those uh, conferences, events. Yeah. You're just increasing or you're, you're broadening your network. Well, we'll get off this real quick in, in a second, but you know, just like, you know, people are afraid to like spend money on those events and go to these different things, but yet they'll go to school. And like you were going to be a doctor for 10, or, you know, 10 or 12 yeah. years and they're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on that. But then to go, go to an event that might cost you a couple grand for the ticket or whatever. Yeah, man. It could, the, the return could be in, infinite, you know? I, I mean, I've these, these last two years while I've been in school, I mean, I've missed a lot of school traveling to go to these things or spend time. Like, um, 
in May, I know it wasn't May, last September, I was in uh, California and I was able to get up in front of a group and speak on behalf of Indianapolis and kind of what I was doing. And that has just, it's been pivotal in my business. And I mean, yeah, you're missing a couple of days of class, but you just, a lot of college students just don't understand that right now. And like for me, you know, people are like, oh, dude, well, you know, why are you finishing school? It's like, well, you know, I've come this far, right? Might as well. I don't have any student loan debt. And it's great because like the business professors are like, Hey man, you know, when you get out of here, let us know when your next deal is. Right. <laughs> and so like for me, that's, that's, that's encouraging. Right. And I have some, some of these professors who they own businesses, you know, 50, 60 employees. And, and for them to say that to a 20 year old kid, it's like, okay, well maybe I'm, maybe I'm onto something here. So I enjoy that. I enjoy learning, not always, you know, beating the book, but, whether it's conference, I mean, all that kind of stuff. This right here is learning, right? I'm learning from you. You're vice versa. Yeah. Can't, you can't, you always got to be a sponge. Awesome. Cool. So what about a favorite app? You got a favorite app that you use? Favorite app? Um, let's see here. Where's my phone? Um, in terms of like social media or what? Just like an app that helps you in real estate or it doesn't have to be real estate. Just like helps you be more productive or something you use on like, you know, daily. Um, so I am a big uh, Google Calendar person. Mm-hmm. Google Calendar. I'm just. I'm trying to look here. Google Calendar and uh, and Box uh, Box.com are really good ones. I keep a lot of documents on Box. It's, it's kind of like a Google Drive. Okay. But Google Google Calendar for me. Uh, it, I have all my class schedules on there. Workout schedules. You know. You name it. This was on there. It just. I think when you have a busy schedule like that, it's it makes it easier for you to to stay organized. Perfect. Yep, definitely. So what about a, uh, a mindset tip? Do you have a mindset tip? Like sometimes if you get down and you stop getting motivated, what's something that you do to get yourself back on track? So I, uh, I meditate, um, like five, 10 minutes a day, uh, just kind of cool down, whether it's in the middle of the day. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily like a mindset thing, but it's kind of like a reset button. Right. Yeah. And, um, I don't, yeah, I, I can't say I have a, like a certain thing. I don't know. Maybe you, do you do something? I mean, what do you? No. Yeah. That's something like that. I mean, for me, it's like uh, getting to the gym. Um, okay. I, just, okay. I just love getting to the gym. Even okay. what it does is for me, half the time, I really hate going to the gym and I get there and I'm just like, God damn, another day at the gym. But when I get into it, I get focused and I get my mind right. And by the end, I'm like, all right, boom, I'm ready to okay. go. Yeah. I, I guess I would, I would agree with that. I hate waking up late like if i wake up at like nine i'm like ah, yeah, like never because i really enjoy being up before everybody else and like nobody's bothering me i can get my workout in i can read i can eat breakfast like it's just time to yourself that you can kind of focus on yourself i mean working out uh it's it's that's one of my favorite things about the morning yeah no definitely Okay. What about a, uh, influencer? What's somebody that you follow online, like a social media influencer that's not full of crap and actually you get meaning from. So, uh, I don't know if you know this guy or not, Justin Spaulding. Do you know him? Uh -uh. He's a a good one. Check him out. Um, you know, there's a ton of people out there, you know, yeah, your Grant Cardone, your Gary B. I'm, I, I like those guys. I think that you have to be careful with some of the things that you're subscribing to, right? I think there's some really great points. Um, but yeah, I would say Justin Spalding is, is a good guy. I think he's 29 or 30. Um, he's a, he's a big multifamily guy and, um, started pretty young, got into some four units, but just, just genuine, right? Like he gives it to you straight. Um, I think a lot of folks on social media try to give a perception that they're bigger than what they are. They're doing something cooler. And, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I guess with even my own, um, tr- social media, like if I go into a house and it's just freaking destroyed, I'm like, Oh, this is great. Like people love this. Right. Yeah. It's not like that, you know, kind of uppity, like, Oh, this is a $10 million house. And like, no, there's, there's like bullets in there. Or who knows what. Right. Yeah. Um, I like to shoot it straight. Cause I think, I think you get more out of that, but uh, yeah, Justin Spalding is a good one. Um, I'm trying to think okay. of anybody else. I don't do Twitter. I don't either. Like I, do, I like Instagram. I do Facebook, but LinkedIn's a good platform. Um, right. So cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, what, what's the best advice you have for somebody that like really wants to get into it, but they're just like stuck in that analysis paralysis. What, what should they do? 
Well, um, I mean, I think you've got to take a look at, at your market. Really, I, I would just write your, I would, I would sit down and write like a little five-year plan and say, hey, where do I want to be? I, I have a lot of guys that will come, guys and gals that will come to me and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a whatever profession and I, I can't freaking stand it, right? How do, how do I get out? And, you know, is it, hey, I need, I need two houses at 500 bucks a month to, to get me out of here. I need 50 houses. I need 500, right? Whatever it is, houses, apartments. Um, and I would just say, Hey, look, it, at some point you're going to have to pull the trigger because if you don't, you're going to continue to look back and say, Oh, well, you know, why, why didn't I do that? Or, I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty cliche, uh, advice there, but I'm glad that I can't tell you how many, like 50, even 60 year old guys and, and gals I talk to, they're like, man, I wish I would have started when I was your age. Right. And I just don't ever want to get into the, the mindset to where I'm like, Oh, I'm ahead of everybody. I'm like right now I feel like, dude, I'm, I'm the far, like I'm, I'm trying to sprint to catch up. Right. Yeah. Um, so I just keep that in mind because I, I think that either you can hang out and kind of work for somebody else the rest of your life, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't know, from a good attorney friend of mine, um, he always told, he told me, you know, you're not going to get wealthy working for somebody else. So take that for what it is. I don't and know. Take, and take action. <laughs> Just start making, set up your dominoes to like move ahead. Yeah. Do the next yeah. most important step. Yeah. Just jump in. So, all right. Cool. Well, Zach, where can people find out more about you? Uh, so, you can follow me on social media, uh, Zach Harith, H O E R E T H. I'm sure this will be in the show notes, or you can visit my website, uh, ZachHarith.com. Um, uh, I'm pretty active on, on Instagram and LinkedIn. And, uh, put out a couple blogs on, on my, uh, my website, but I really enjoy the videos that I do on, on LinkedIn and, and uh, Instagram. I don't know. I think it's more interactive for people and they can kind of um, determine, Hey, this, this person's actually giving some value here. It's not just, Hey, here, go read my 1500 blog posts. I don't know. I like sure. it. I'm, I, I kind of have like a humorous twist on my social media. So I don't know. I try not to, I try not to keep it, uh, keep it too serious. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. So if somebody wanted to come to the Indianapolis market, they can just, uh, check you out on social or at Zach. Yeah, just DM me or, or, uh, send me a message on, uh, on my website and, uh, or, or you can email me Zach at Zach And, um, yeah, you can come to the market, check some stuff out. And what brokerage do you work for or t- real estate team? I work for a small mom and pop company. It's called elite Indie realty group. Um, but, uh, there's only, gosh, probably four, five agents. And, uh, so hoping to not hoping, but in the process of growing that team. So you're looking for some single families or small multifamilies. We could, we could certainly, uh, get you hooked up and, and help you navigate the neighborhoods. Okay. So I was at elite indie realty group. Yeah. Realty Sorry, group. Okay. That's a mouthful. Cool. Well, Zach, man, this is a great episode. I really enjoyed that's talking to you. Lot, man. Yeah. Lot, man. Yeah. Thanks I for being like here, we're, getting, we're, just, we're getting to know each other even more now. So, oh yeah, no, it's cool. And, and so everybody, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm flying out there and tomorrow actually, and me and Zach are going to look at some stuff. So Zach, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. And I'll see you in a couple of days. Thanks so much, Justin. See you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.